I kind of like was having my doubts with staying and bleeding through and I was kind of struggling living overseas. Um, we ended up not touring as much as I thought, like towards the end. So I'm like suddenly not making any money and couldn't just go get a job at Starbucks or whatever because I had a, a visa to only work with bands there. So I decided to leave and I was just going to move home to Australia and just kind of like figure out what was next. And then I was on my last two with Bleeding Through. I hadn't told them I was leaving yet, but I went. Um, Bring Me was playing a show on the same night and we had already toured together twice with Prom. Or sorry, once at this point. Um, and oh, it was twice. So um, we, we supported them out in the UK um, for the first time and then we traded and brought them out to the, the Prom Say Goodbye Tour. So I, I saw them on the same night bleeding through play to show in like Philly or something and went out to their show just to hang with the boys. And I ended up chatting with a couple of them and they were similar thing again. They were having issues with their guitar player. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. I'm literally about to leave bleeding through after this tour. So, if, you know, I just offered to fill in or whatever. I didn't know what their plans were. And um, yeah, like two, three months later, I was learning their songs and I flew in for my first show with them was a massive festival in Germany called Rock. Rockham Ring and I flew in and hadn't rehearsed or done anything with the band literally landed on the day of the show went on stage with them and hope for the best <laughs> super professional <laughs> um I would yeah so I was with bring me for three years um I joined right after they dropped suicide season so I kind of came in on the whole touring cycle for that album and it was I think on every one of the shows they played for that record um then they did like a a pretty cool EDM remix thing of the album, which no band had done at the time. And it was kind of just before this wave of like, you know, heavy bands collabing with EDM artists and whatnot. And um, Skrillex did a remix for it. And I think that was his first ever release as Skrillex. Yeah. Which was kind of a... You guys played a show in Perth. I was actually in America at the time, but me and Delby were booking because we, we threw all the nightclub parties and stuff. And we booked Skrillex his first show in Australia, which was in Perth and you guys were playing the same night. And then after the show, Ollie, I don't know, I don't know if you came down, but Ollie came down and to the Skrillex show, which was in this tiny venue um, opposite Amplifier. And he yeah. did a, they did the song together and there was yeah. like footage of it and stuff. That. Yeah. Oh, that. Yeah. That's fucking nuts. That was sick. They held like a hundred people or something. Yeah. Yep. That was a male strip club. Do you know oh. that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so at, at midnight, at midnight, they finished like the hens parties and stuff. And then it yeah. switched over into being a nightclub that Skrillex played at, which was pretty fucking nuts. I, know, I thought you were going to say that, like they kicked Skrillex out and then guys <laughs> and dudes and just not. came in. It was just magic <laughs> mic. <laughs> <laughs> I played a few strip clubs actually, and it's weird. Like you get there for load in, and it's like the day team there, like still up on the tables, and you're like, where do we put our amps? <laughs> <laughs> next to the buffet yeah that's one thing about american strip clubs that i have never seen anywhere else in the world is like the buffet at the strip club and i don't understand why is it maybe because people just post up there for that long that they require sustenance midway through or something but also strip yeah. club buffet can't really seem that appealing to me <laughs> It's got to be some kind of health risk, surely. Um, <laughs> there's actually one I, I heard about. I don't think it's there anymore, but I always heard about it in Portland because it was all vegan. And it was like a lot of the strippers were vegan and they had a vegan menu and you can go get, you know, seitan wings or whatever. And I was intrigued by that because I like to eat seitan wings. But yeah, I never made it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a super niche strip club. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I'm personally pretty intrigued. <laughs> so what happened with Bring Me when you decided to bounce on that? Was that just the timing? Um, the Bring Me thing was a bit different. I uh, We had just finished recording Sempaternal. So that was my second album with them. And I was sort of partly involved in that. That was like this weird time where they brought in Jordan, who was the guy that like sort of replaced me, but not really. He was He became the keyboard player and did a lot of the songwriting and production. And um, so he actually came in just to write with the band, um, you know, because he was in this other band at the time called Worship and they just were like this really cool, like dark synth wavy kind of almost like some dark synth wave pop kind of stuff with melodic vocals. And 
that was one cool thing about being in that band. It like opened my musical horizons up to a lot of like different bands I hadn't heard before. And they were already at this point kind of like a bit bored with like the standard, you know, the hardcore bands and a lot of the heavy music and the death core. And so they were like looking for different ways to just diversify and find this sound and which they, they did. And Jordan was a big part of that. So he came in and, yeah, I don't know. It was kind of weird. It ended up being kind of like closed door writing sessions where he and Ollie were working together a lot. And that was when Ollie was learning to sing as well. Um, Lee did most of the writing in that band. I wrote like, I don't know, I would say conservative, conservatively about like 25% of the, the riffs and stuff on the previous album, there is a hell. And, you know, it was more of like a jam situation. We're all in the room together, figuring songs out. Um, and this was different. So Ollie and Jordan and Lee mostly were in their writing. And I was kind of like off in a hotel with our bass player who didn't have a place to live and neither did I. So we just had a hotel for like months and months. It was really weird. Um, and I was writing riffs on my own, just kind of like sending them stuff. Um, so some of my stuff did make it on the record, but um, in that band, I, I kind of was a little enabled in some ways. Like I joined this band that was young and massive and just like on another level than what I was used to. And I was like a hardcore kid and I'm like used to like talking to fans after the show and, you know, you wait at the merch table and shit like that. And they like, not that they weren't like good to their fans or anything, but they just, there was like, a, a, you know, their fans are like, fanatic so like there was kids that found out where they lived like their their apartment block and they would like go and wait out the front of their apartment and like kind of stalker status stuff um and i just you know that they, they were kind of like the party band and always like getting into some kind of controversy and i kind of like got wrapped up in it all and i'm like oh cool like i can you know suddenly all these people follow me on twitter and like care about things i say and and i ended up just posting a bunch of shit and it was this kind of like combination of like me going too overboard on trying to be like in this edgy band but to the point where like it started almost maybe hurting the band you know i was like posting jokes that were off color or like inappropriate stuff because i'd seen them kind of do stuff like that but not on a social media platform or like at an after party or something and i you know don't drink never have and didn't really like party that much so i guess that was my like contribution and it's there's not really much else to tell but like the relationship kind of broke down and then i ended up having a meeting with the manager um and he kind of gave me this list of things that they were unhappy about and i didn't really get a chance to like fix it it was just like hey they're not happy about this oh and by the way like we think we're just gonna like part ways so that was after three years i think the end of 2012 we just yeah the record was done but not out and we just um played like the London Vans Warp Tour at Ali Pali, a 12,000 cap venue. And I so yeah, there was only two shows that we played with me and Jordan in the band together. Um, and that was a warm up for that show and then that show. So did you struggle cool. with that? Show. Like I would imagine, so I'm trying to look at it almost like, you know, a job. Like if my manager comes to me and is like, hey man, you're fucking up this, 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 and this. It's okay because there's a demarcation between who I am as a person, who I am outside and what I do for a living. It's kind of easy to separate those two, but I think playing for a band, I mean, a lot of that would be tied into who you are as a person, your persona. Was it, was it a struggle for you to have to take that criticism on board? Were you able to, to separate the two? Um, or was that something you struggled to kind of deal with personally as well? Yeah, no, it was, it was fucked up for me. Um, and I think like when I, after I had that meeting, I, I actually was going, I was doing some stuff with prom on the side at this point. So we'd just done a couple of European festivals and we were actually about to support Parkway. It was like their, I think the Atlas tour in December of 2012. So I was already like doing other stuff, but I remember like coming out of that meeting, I'm in London. I'm like, fuck, I have to like get a train to Sheffield now and like pack up everything I own here, like three years worth of things and like somehow figure out how to get as much of it back to Australia. And I like changed my flight. I was supposed to fly out a week later. And then I, I flew out straight away and just kind of like put that behind me. But 
Um, yeah, it was really hard. I remember moving home to Adelaide, like having to live at my brother's house, not having a job, money, a place to live. Um, and I remember chatting with a friend of mine and I just felt like my whole like identity as a person was just like pulled out from under me. And, you know, it was like, what am I going to do now? Is prom going to do something? I don't know. Am I going to go and get a job at Woolies? I don't know. <laughs> like, and honestly, it's taken me until like pretty recently to to be able to like reflect on everything that went down. And there was some like, you know, some lame beef stuff that happened between us online after that. And then we figured it out and we kind of went through the legal process and got the settlement happening. And, um, but yeah, it was really hard. And, it, and it, at first I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like these guys do stuff like this all the time, but they like picked on me and they used it as a reason to, to get me out of the van. And they've got this new guy now. And, they're all tired. And there was always a bit of a divide, you know, cause I was, they all grew up together and were like, like super tight from a young age and I'm the outsider and I'm from another country. And so there's just, and I don't drink or party and they all do. And it worked in a lot of ways, but you know, in hindsight, the, the differences were obvious. Um, um, but yeah, it was, it took me a long while to kind of like be able to look back at everything. I actually pulled out all the the notes and everything just the other day. I found them in my house here when I was cleaning out a box and I read through and like instant trauma back to that moment, like how I felt and how upset I was. And I got, you know, got really depressed. Um, but I've been able to like grow as a person and realize like, yeah, these things that I did that were fine, then, you know, I can see how they were fucked up. And even if they were doing similar stuff, um, that doesn't justify my behavior. And I don't know. I, I think I just took it all for granted a little bit too much. And that's obvious now, like looking at where they're at as a band and what they've achieved. And I just was like, I don't know, having fun and in a huge band and had all this attention I'd never had before and just didn't process it maybe the way they had over like a longer period of time mm. it's perspective though isn't it i mean you can't you can only live those moments in the way that they approach you and i mean to you you would have been you know you were in prom you guys certainly exceeded like all expectation with that and then you're in you know shuffle along to bleeding through and then suddenly you're in um bring me in it's and it's fucking huge it's that would that's a pretty wild ride like that's not the normal human experience so there's not that many people you'd be able to talk to and be like uh, i don't know how i'm doing in this space you know like it's like it it all seems to be going pretty well did you get no you had that meeting with the management did you get to sort of speak to the band and be like yo we can work this out or was it just kind of like okay i've got to now just move yeah no it was pretty done at that point um i did reach out to them all letting them know i was going to come up to Sheffield and you know like I wanted to say goodbye at the uh, and I was just like a whirlwind of emotion then and but I at least wanted to like be able to say bye to these people I'd spent three years with like no matter what kind of went down and I think only one of them ended up showing up which was kind of sad uh, or replying but I did I did see a couple of them not even a couple months later because they did sound wave right after that and um, that was where some of the like weird beef stuff went down and um i ended up hanging out with two or three of them just to kind of this is unnecessary like whatever's happening now doesn't need to happen like let's just fucking figure it out and squash it because we're all trying to move on so um and uh, since that i haven't really kept in contact with any of them um i've bumped into a few of them randomly at festivals here and there um i probably speak to lee the most the guitar player um I think we are always had a really good relationship and especially like working well together, writing and understanding each other's like perspective from like the business sense of the band as well. Club, I